Ask not what we all be to do for you. Ask what you can do for we all be. Hey, Ron, son, Mama D here. Happy Father's Day to you. You never know what little Ron heard or RTC2s are running around. <laughs> and they just didn't tell you. <laughs> And I see the phone lines are lit up. We're going to get to the phone callers in a minute. We've got another special guest coming up that I want to get to, and then we'll get into the phone lines. Y'all can join the conversation. Just be patient because we've got a lot to cover in a short period of time. I want to bring in this wonderful, extraordinary young man. He is a true mover and shaker, a world maker, a image maker, a creator, uh, extraordinaire, a great motivational speaker, author, life coach, extraordinaire. Brother Larry Jamison Jr., are you there? Hey, Brother Ron, I'm here. How you doing, sir? Hey, it's all to have you. I'm good and blessed and highly favored. I got you on my team, on my show, at least. And I can't complain. Mm -hmm. Doing all right? Oh, man, I'm doing fantastic. I, I like to tell people if I was doing any better, I'd be tripping. <laughs> I heard that. I just want to say I thoroughly enjoyed the book that you gave me last year. How to Make It in a World Not Made for You. I actually read it on my way to New York. It was a true page turner. And it's so prophetic to some of the stuff that you touch upon in your book, considering what has happened since that time. We know there was a Ferguson insurrection and also with Donald Sterling and so many other things happening in the world today. It would be an honor to get your perspective on it. Hey, man, that's what I'm here for. I, I wrote the book so that I could share some, some insight and, uh, you know, how it looks through my eyes. And I know my, my view is not going to be the exact same as everybody else's, but by the time I was 16 years old, good brother, I had lived in six different states and been in six different school systems. I got to see a lot, you know, uh, across racial lines, across educational lines. And one thing I learned was one thing I can't affect is what happens to me. I can affect what I do for myself. I can't affect what other people are going to do, but I control what Larry Jemison was going to do. So pretty much what you were read, man, was, was my life and how it pertains to the world. And then that's how I came up with how to make it in a world that wasn't made for you. Because I'm going to be honest with you, man. They say when in Rome, do as the Romans. But guess what? <laughs> We're not Romans. So we got we to gotta, we gotta do what we can do to, uh, to stay alive and, and make our impact on the world. I'm actually just, I've been asking people this question from different backgrounds. I just would love to get your input on this because you wrote a book about this in a way. Can a black person get justice in this system as it's designed today? You said, can a black person get justice? Yeah, can a black person get justice in this system? Sure they can. Sure they can. Uh, the legal system, you know, is here to, to impact justice across all of us. The only problem is we've done such a poor job of, of, you know, really putting our image out there and what the black image really is that a lot of times as soon as we walk to the courtroom, the system is already swayed against us. Mm -hmm. um, so can we get justice? Yes, we can. Does it happen most often? I'm afraid not. What do you think about the case with the two brothers in North Carolina that spent 30 years in prison on death row for the majority of the time for a crime of murdering and raping an 11-year-old girl that they didn't do, even though there was no evidence tying them to the scene of the crime? What do you think about stuff like that when you read or hear about things of that nature? You know, Brother Ron, I'm going to be honest with you, man. I'm not surprised. You know, those type of stories are going on across the country, and they're going to continue to go on. I mean, just think about it. Before DNA, think about how many brothers were getting the blame shifted to them simply because, you know, it was easy to close that case by pinning it on somebody who already had a rap sheet. They would, you know, their uh, their records were, were already proven as, as maybe having problems or being problems in the community. So when they step into the courtroom, it's easy to say this person did it or that person did it. And who's going to argue? You know, the person has already, you know, given up all credibility. So it doesn't surprise me about those brothers in North Carolina. Um, it's just it's one of those things that we have to change our mind shifts as a community. Um, and, 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 you know, the, 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 the problem with that is what oftentimes people see as a shortcut truly is not the shortcut. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm an I'm a upstanding citizen. Am I a perfect man? By, by no means, no. But I am an upstanding citizen. I mean, I'm not trying to break any laws, and I'm not trying to get mixed up with any type of foolishness. doesn't mean it won't happen. But the, the, the chances are I'm not going to get caught up in a lot of the other stuff uh, that, 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 that's going on simply because I try to keep my record clean. I try to keep my credibility high. 
So at least somebody can stand up for Larry Johnson and say, you know what, it may have gotten done, but I don't think this guy did it. And, and that doesn't mean we're going to be free and clear. It doesn't mean we're going to, because the world isn't fair. And that's the first chapter of my book. Life is not fair, so get over it. Mm-hmm. We got to do what we can to help ourselves look better in the court of law, because I've been there. I've been sitting on a jury, and I've seen young men come in on, on, on drug cases, and I'm the only African-American on the jury. And we've been yeah. deliberating, and I'm saying, wait a minute, we don't have the proof to convict this person. I know what you're saying, and I know he has a prior record, but we don't have the proof to put this man behind bars for 10 to 15 years. And I'll sway a couple people and sway a few more people, but in the bottom line, <laughs> when you look at the legal documents, the laws have been written to get people caught up on things that shouldn't be done. Uh, for those people that have ever been in a crime, say like a, 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 a drug crime, you know, maybe moving dope or trafficking or, or or a suspicion of trafficking. There is part of the law that says that possession can either be constructive or it can be, and I don't even know the other word for it, but basically it can be on your person or you can have a willingness, intent to take possession of that drug and it becomes yours. What I'm saying is, wait a minute, either it's on me or it's not. When the police pulled me over, when the police arrested me, Either I have the drugs and you say you are charged with possession or it's not me having the drugs, so I can't be charged with possession. But the laws are written now that if you have a knowledge of or they can prove that you have a willingness to take control of those drugs, meaning it's in a hotel room that you know about. You're not in it when they break in, but you know it's there and you have a willingness to take it on. You can be charged with that crime. So... What I'm saying is nowadays the laws are written for you to lose because in most cases if you try to go to trial, it would be hard to prove that that was your dope. It would be very hard to prove that was your dope if you didn't have it on you. And probably a lot of people will get in the walk. And they say, no, we're not going to let them walk. We're going to do it this way and rewrite this law so that we can get some convictions. Knowing that, <laughs> man, I try to stay as far away from dope and anybody who's doing it, anybody who's selling it, anybody who's using it. What I'm saying is I got to protect me at this point, Brother Ron. Mm-hmm. I hear you, but also you said you was the only black popular, I mean, corrupt. Go ahead. What was the question? No, I was saying that. I was listening to what you said about you being the only black juror in a trial for a black man. The fact that so many brothers and sisters are being sent to jail, not by a trial of a juror of their peers, is a problem to me. Like, it's folks on death row of color. They have been sent to death row with no evidence connecting them to the scene of the crime with no jury of their true peers. So, like, like you know, like you already said that the game is, is, is fixed in so many words. So my thing is, can any black person get any type of justice in this system? Well, you, you know, again, like I said, is it possible? Yes. Does it happen often? No. We go in, we walk into the courtroom with the stigma that uh, we're probably guilty. You know, instead of being innocent to mm-hmm. guilty, we walk in looking guilty. And what it, whatever that looking guilty means, you know, just take it for whatever it's worth. But you come in, you don't have uh, the, the law on your side. And, and um, you know, when you talk about not being able to be tried by a jury of your peers, that's the same thing as voting. You know, right. it, when you look at, Populations, and you say, man, these, this this town is eighty five percent minority, mm-hmm. but the makeup of their government, their local government, is twelve percent minority. I mean, it's an inverted relationship. It's a flip flop. It's the exact same thing. Now, does that mean that a black man can't get justice from a white man? No, we we really need to dispel those rumors. And that, that's we, we we we. I know some great folks who just happen to be white folks. Okay. Mm-hmm. I have some great friends that just happen to be white. They will look out and stand up when they kneel, when they need to or feel compelled to, I should say. Okay. What we need to do to change the guard, we need to earn more of their respect, Ron. What I mean is, I know this is, this is definitely anti-militant view, but mm-hmm. here's what I know. I know that there's some good people out there, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, what have you. I know okay. I know there are some people that when they stand up for me, their mm-hmm. word is more credible than my word, which means mm-hmm. that if we ought to truly take over and take some control and take some power amongst our community, instead of trying to push the white folks out, I think we need to embrace those who want to help. 
Now, bear with me on this because I know a lot of your callers probably going to say, man, what is this guy saying? <laughs> okay. saying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know people say, man, who is this guy? But here's what I know. I know that people say that we are a godly community. Mm-hmm. Many will say they're Muslim, they're Christian, they're whatever, whoever they pray to, that, that, that we are pretty good folks. But what we need is those people who say, hey, I want to go to or take my family to attend the white church. Okay, mm-hmm. majority white. They are a non denominational church. And our pastor is going to feed me. He's not going to just talk about money and success. He's going to feed me. He's going to give me what I'm looking for. That's mm-hmm. fine. I have no problem with where you work. But I do want to see your pastor on the front line when one of ours gets gunned down in the streets. I want to see your pastor, who you feel like is feeding you, I want to see him or her supporting the cause. Say, hey, I have members of the congregation that look like you, so therefore our church of 8,000, 10,000, 12,000 are going to stand out on the front lines for a young black male that's been shot down in the street. That's what I'm looking for. And then what happens? What happens is we end up earning the trust and the loyalty from other folks that we've even intended to hit. But that's okay. And then what ends up happening is the corporation starts to back it. And they say, oh, the pastor of first such and such, such and such, is now on board, and he's, he's, he's not standing for, or he's intolerant to the shootings in the street. So now Walmart has come on our side. AT&T mm-hmm. has come on our side. So these are, what I'm saying is we must earn the respect and trust of other markets. You know, all this stuff about blacks need to rally, blacks need to organize, blacks need to, we do, okay? We do. Mm-hmm. Don't get me wrong. We do need to do all those things. But we also need to support other American people and as of today and as of in history, there are other races that have more respect than black folks. So because they have the respect and because they can get our community leaders to move and because they can get laws changed, I would like to see the white churches, the corporations, and come and support. It's a killing in the street. You call yourself a godly person. They are killing unarmed black men in every city, every state, mm-hmm. every day. We want to see your support. What I mean is, I know that's going to be different from a lot of people's rationale. They're going to say, man, we need to loot and bitch and rat and rave and let's go to war with the police and this and that. I'm going, man, that's not, the, that's not the fight you want. That's not the fight you want. The fight we want is against education. Let's get our kids educated. Let's get them understanding that at some point you will no longer be 23 years old. You will be 43, and you will have mm-hmm. children, and you will want the best for them. Let's get them out of that militant, irate, gang-banging stage because that won't last forever. Let's, the best gift, Ron, that we could ever give our kids, and I, I say our, I don't mean your personal or my personal, I mean right. the black youth in general. The best thing we can give the black youth, youth in general is a snapshot into the future. Hey, 20 years from now, this is what your life can become. That's the best. It's not a pair of Ed Jordans. It's not a new car. It's not the best gift we can give you to say, man, if I can show you a vision of what life could be for you, you might change your ways. I mean, that's powerful. I mean, like I said, you know, you already know your audience well. A lot of black folks are not going to agree with what you have said, but a lot of some black folks do agree with what you said. I mean, you you are a person that's a Tuskegee graduate. You come from a, a well-rounded and strong family background. You're a successful businessman. You're a motivational speaker. But are you in fear of your life, regardless of all these accolades and accomplishments and where you come from, are you afraid of the police? <laughs> that's a very that's a very delicate question, very slippery slope. Um, mm-hmm. but I'm a but I'm gonna be as candid and as real and keep it as one hundred as I can. No, I'm not afraid of the police. Mm-hmm. What? Do I think I'm immune to the treatment? I'm definitely not. Have I been illegally stopped and frisked and, and asked to get out the car? Sure, I have. Because the police, when they pull me over, they don't know all those things that you just announced, that I come from a well-rounded background, that I'm a Tuskegee University graduate, that I'm not here to place any harm up in their life. They don't know those things. All they see is a black man riding down the street in a pretty fancy car. You know, that's what they see. But when they pull me over, guess what I do? I usually drive an extra 200 to 300 yards, Brother Ron, just so I can take a little time to get myself together. 
I'm getting mm-hmm. my license together. I have my registration together. I have everything that I think I'm going to need in that traffic stop, and I'm pulling over. And the officer will often ask, so why, I was behind you 200 yards. Why didn't you pull over immediately? I said, oh, well, first, officer, I didn't think you were coming for me. But then when I realized you were stopping me, I wanted to make sure I was, I was ready. By the time mm-hmm. he walks or she walks up to that door, I have my hands on the door seal. They can see both hands on the door seal. They're kind of sliding up onto the side of the car. Both my hands are in plain view. There is going to be no reaching for anything, no, no rush movement. I don't want to be a statistic. I want that that officer to know immediately, look, you're dealing with somebody who values his life. Let's be sensible about this. The second thing is I'm going to address that officer, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, no, sir, no, ma'am. There is no big talk. I'm not going to try to beat you. I'm not going to say you a punk and you were that and you were this and you, you have no reason pulling me over. Why did you pull me over? That's not the fight at that point. Mm-hmm. I think if I'm going to beat an officer, it has to be beat in the courtroom because I can't win on the street. My word is not strong enough to beat that officer in the street. No matter mm-hmm. what goes down, my word doesn't carry enough weight. If I'm going to beat the officer, it's going to be in the court of law, and I just have to take my chances. I may lose in the court, but at least I'm breathing the next day. Well, actually, this is the boy. What you did all the so things, am I, though. Of, am I afraid? I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of the police. I think it's a very delicate situation, which means that I'm subject to the same things that our, our kids are seeing. When I get pulled over, it is a very delicate, slippery slope, and I have to be prepared because uh, I'm just another African-American out here trying to make it, but they don't know that. Here's an officer who may or may not be well-trained, may or may not be well-prepared, and he may or may not be having a good day. Right. And he walks up on me, and I say or do the wrong thing, and I end up with my life expired. That's not what I want, and that's not what I want for the kids around the globe. Well, actually, this is the, what if you did everything you said the right way, in a respectful way, and your life is still in danger? Do you believe in self-defense, mm-hmm. or are you willing to gamble with your life? Like, let's say if the officer still doesn't treat you properly, and as, as a matter of fact, you know, your life is in danger at that point. What would you do? Would you just accept your fate and say it is what it is, or... Would you fight back? You might not make it to court the next you know, day. Or... You're exactly right. That's a tough one. Um, again, when I'm when I'm preparing myself, I'm preparing to diffuse the situation. I'm trying to put the the officer at ease at that mm-hmm. point. Uh, I'm trying to make sure he knows that look, I'm not gonna hurt you, but you don't hurt me either. That's what I'm trying to do up front. In the event things turn and the officer just doesn't have, you know, any. Uh, he has no way to stop his, his anger or his frustration or whatever it is. I'm not sure what I would do in that moment. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I think I think at that point your adrenaline is going to kick in and you will make some moves. Uh, again, I'm trying to make sure that the ultimate result or the ultimate end result is that I'm leaving with my life. So I won't make any moves against the officer that I think is going to get me killed. I mean, assuming he's the one with the gun and I'm not, I'm going to have to think it through and uh, see what I can do. And hopefully by the time, you know, uh, th- the whole thing unfolds, I will be able to leave with my life. I'm not, I'm going to tell you, Brother Ron, I'm not trying to have an altercation in right. the street because I know it's too easy for the gun to go off. And the, the story that's being told by the officer is that, hey, we had a struggle. He beat me down. He hit me. He do, do, do. I don't want it. So I'm trying to defuse the situation up front. There's no guarantees in anything, though. Well, actually, just, I mean, I'm listening to you talk. I mean, I, I think you make some great points and valid points. But do your white friends understand what black folks got to go through on a daily basis? Do they even understand what you're going through? Like the fact that we got to even talk about this as black men and talk about these type of realities and tell our kids about this. Can they really appreciate your struggle or your story? You know, I mean, in your opinion, can your white friends and other race friends, can they really appreciate how you came to where you came to by going through what you have been going through? They, they can't. They, they do not. Um, okay. It, it's just a matter of, you know, what affects your life will will be a little bit more prevalent, a little bit more uh, relevant. You know, it, it's like watching somebody else's kid go down on the football field. Mm-hmm. You feel sorry for them, but it's, it's not your kid. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, you, you hope they hope they feel better, but that's not my little girl. That's not my son. So no, I don't think my uh, my white friends can really identify with what I go to. I think they will try to relate, and I think they understand that there's some abuses that as a black man I will have to go through some things. I think they do understand that. But to what extent, 
I don't think they 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 uh they know, and I don't think they concern themselves with it. At the end of the day, you know, five o'clock wolf school comes, and, and it's the end of the work day. They're going home, and I'm stereotyping here, but they're they're going home to their suburban communities uh, with the nicer schools and the nicer roads. And when they call the police, they're there within two minutes, and it's a different lifestyle than coming from the block and understanding what that is or who that person is. When it when it doesn't affect you, you you really don't get it. You really don't understand. You know what I mean? It's kind of like at this point trying to put yourself in the life of a homeless man. Mm-hmm. You can feel sorry for him, but you don't know what it's like living under that bridge. Right. You know, you don't, you don't know what it is. To, it's, I don't think they really get it. I don't think they really understand it. And it's not their fault. I, I, I post all of these things on my Facebook. I post all these things on my Instagram. I'm trying mm-hmm. to expose the world that, hey, black folks are suffering. This isn't right. This isn't cool. And it affects me, too. I get pulled over, too. Y'all are my friends. You understand me. But I suffer, too. And I really would like your support. I, I do post every all of this media stuff, um, you know, whether it's Trayvon or Jordan Davis or, 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 or Mike Brown. I mean, it's, it's getting to the point I'm an advocate for getting out social change that needs to get out. You know, I don't post all the fighting and the break dancing and the this. I don't do all that. I'm posting, I'm, I'm, I'm posting things that I hope are going to spark an interest and then get a result. Because if we start, we went, I'm telling you, you remember when Michael Vick got into that trouble for dog fighting? Yes, sir. I remember it, yeah. Mm-hmm. PETA, which is an organized organization, mm-hmm. man, they were all after this guy. There was nothing he could do. This group was adamant about getting their calls heard and getting the conviction amongst Michael Vick. What I'm saying is I'm looking to get that type of organization and have some type of, and I know Peter is not the word, but some type of Peter-like organization for black people. And I know you could say, well, we have our own organizations. Look, I don't I don't confuse leading blacks with black leaders. That's one thing I don't do. <laughs> I don't look out and see who's, who's on the, <laughs> I don't I don't look out and see who's on the cover of this magazine or who's the headline on the CNN anchor desk or what. You know, and I'm gonna keep it real with you. I um, did you see Ayala Van Zant? Ayala fixed my life uh, when she went to Ferguson. Yes, sir, I seen that. Yes, brother. You know, I'm gonna be candid with you. I, I'm glad the Oprah Network was there. I'm glad Ayala felt the need to cover it, but I don't think she was the right person to get deep down in the trenches with those folks. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I saw a lot of signs with a five step program. This is what we need to do, and this is. But it's deeper than that. Our mm. solutions, our search are deeper than that. Of course people are going to come out and see what you're talking about. you got camera crew, camel crews walking through their street. That's not what this was. This was no celebrity contest. This was not a, a fix my life five-step approach. This is going to take some time. It's going to take some real leaders. It's going to take some people that don't care about the money. Right. Some people that aren't bought. Some people that, that are saying, man, I'm just doing this for the love, and I'm going to get 200 other people to do this, and we're going to meet every Tuesday until we feel like we're getting the results, and we're going to push, and we're going to campaign, and we're going to push. We're going to start not marching. We're going to start online marches. We're going to raise $3.5 million in the next four months. We're going to do some things that help our kids. We're going to donate to the Young uh, Boys and Girls Club. We're going, to do, we're going to change our schools because it wants to become important to everybody. That's when we're going to have an impact. I look at kids, and there's, there's going to be some kids in every class. Some are going to be making A's and B's. Some are going to be making D's and F's. Now, we all can show why the person who's making the D's and F's are making the D's and F's. Maybe mama's working hard. Maybe daddy's not at home. Maybe auntie's not around to help. Maybe the child hasn't had a hot meal in three days. We can all find those reasons. But when you get to the point where you say, you know what, I'm not going to make any excuse. These, every child in this room needs to be a success. We're talking about fourth graders here. We're not talking about grown kids. We're talking about fourth, fifth grade. And you make a decision. Everybody in this class must get the lesson. How do you do that? I'm I'm searching for 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 for, for clues and and, and uh, examples myself. But I know this: if we could try a, a buddy system, the person who makes A's and B's might sit with the person that's making D's and F's for thirty minutes a day, mm-hmm. and he or she. 
primary role is to just be buddies. Hey, look, we got to get this done. I know you didn't get your homework done last night for whatever reason, but we got to make sure you get the lesson before we can move on, so this is how you do this. It's a buddy system. It may not work, and you may have to pull that, but at least you're trying to say this young boy over here who we assume is from the hood and his mama's not around or his daddy's not around or he's facing all kinds of conditions is not a failure. We're not going to just throw him to the side. Let me ask you this, brother. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. No, I'm going to ask you, I'm glad you brought the Van Zandt thing. I did see some issues with uh, the Van Zandt, so I give a B- minus for Elford, but it was tipping me out that the Zeno of uh, you know, what, uh, the hip-hop show, he was talking about rappers being more accountable to the community, and he's there you know, every week you know, with their reality TV show that basically degrades black people in so many ways. So it was funny to see people's reactions how they were looking kind of conflicted by what he was saying about black rappers and accountability and stuff like that to the community. But my thing is this. I remember reading something that Brother uh, Jesse Jackson, Reverend Jesse Jackson wrote some years ago about being afraid of young black people, in particular young black males. Are you, are you afraid of certain type of black males? Like, you know, I'm talking about GDs and Vice, I'm talking about this gangbanger-looking guys that tatted up with the dreads or whatever. Because my thing is this, is that, I feel like they get something that a lot of black folks don't get, that the system does not care about black people. That's why they act the way they act. The system does not value black life. They get that, and nobody else can really convince them otherwise. So do you feel like you have the, the gravitas or the fortitude, the reach these type of brothers, uh, these street brothers, brothers that have been institutionalized by the I system? Do. You mean me personally? Can I reach them? Yes. Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt, these brothers are doing everything they can to cry out and say, man, somebody help me. Mm-hmm. I don't understand. You, start, you you brought up a word called value. They don't understand what value is. Mm. I mean, that's the first, that's the first part of the, of, the, of the transformation is getting these young brothers to understand what is value. What is value of life? What is value of your, your, your children's lives? What is value of your community? They don't understand it. Nobody's ever been there. Once they were crying out for help, nobody's ever been there to say, hey, look, young brother, I got you. Come talk to me uh, mm-hmm. every other day at 4 o'clock. Come by, come by the church and we got a place for you. Come. I, what I'm saying is they haven't seen anybody that has brought value into their lives deep enough to where they can say, this justifies me not being a knucklehead. This justifies me trying to clean up my act. And let's be honest, it's not going to be easy every time. Here's a young brother told me last week, his mom was shot in front of him by his stepdad six times when he was 16 wow. years old. Yeah. Well, look, I can't just come in with some happy-go-lucky motivational speech and change this guy's life and say, don't do this, don't do that. This guy right. is traumatized. Yeah. So it's going to have to be a culmination of things. It's going to have to be Larry Jemison giving us some powerful nuggets of motivation. It's going to be Larry Jemison have to come by and, and buy him a sandwich every now and then and say, young brother, you're going to be all right. It's going to be... Somebody with a mental uh, health background come in and say, listen, let's, if you're willing to, let's talk about what's going on in your life, not what's going on with the issue, because he might not want to talk about his mom being shot in front of him six times. He right. might want to talk about just things in general, and then you allow him to open up. It's a rehabilitation process just like any other re- rehab process. So, you know, do I feel like they can be reached? Sure, they can. I'm doing it every day. You know, I'm going. I'm working with juvenile justice systems. I'm working with college campuses. I'm working yeah. with high schools. I'm working with people yeah. attempting to get their GEDs. And the one thing I know is when they look up at the front of the room and they see my face on, on these book covers and they see my, 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 you know, my watch and they see how I'm dressed in my suit, a lot of them are asking, man, what do you do? How do you do this? Mm-hmm. They don't understand that there's another way. Nobody's ever took the time to say Hey, look, you got off track, but there's a way back. Let me help you get back on track. And that's what it's going to take. What I'm saying is after a while, everybody in life gets tired of being beat up. And at that point, they're going to make a decision. Now, is that do you do you give up on life? No, I don't think that's it. Do you go back to school, get a GED, or go back to college? Many people do that. You know, I see people 35 years old, like, man, I'm taking night classes, or I'm, taking, I'm online, or I'm doing at some point, the value will be received, whether it's early in your life or late in your life. You know, you were talking about these rappers, and I'm going to tell you, mm-hmm. a lot of rappers don't have the value. Mm-hmm. You know, when I, when I, you know, rap was started in the 70s. I was born in the 70s. Mm-hmm. You know, when I say rap, I mean the rap as we know it. I know people were 
we're rhyming over beats years ago. But I'm saying as far as the right. rap industry, mm-hmm. it started in the early 70s, and it progressed and it progressed, which is a great thing. I think it's produced a number of – it's produced an entrepreneurial spirit like we've never seen before in our community. Mm-hmm. More people are trying to get out here and get it than I've ever seen before. That's what rap music has done. Now, it does have a lot of negative that comes with it, and that just means the rappers don't understand the business. At the time that they sign their contract, they don't realize they're signing their lives away, that they're giving up creative control over what they can and cannot record, Right. and that this is a system built upon generating lots of money off of their backs while giving them a minority portion and making them famous at the same time. So you're going to be famous, you're going to make $2 million for the record company, and you're going to see 50000 of it. That's the way the industry is built. Everybody's not going to be a LL Cool J who's selling millions of copies. Everybody's not going to be uh, a Usher who's multi-platinum. Matter of fact, most people are going to be bust. They're not going to sell those types of numbers. The record company understands we've got to have enough copies from our superstars to cover the losses of our people that we can't get broke, that we can't right. get out there. So what I'm saying is, look, I don't mind you deciding that you want to be a rapper, but I want you to be a rapper who has a college degree. So if it doesn't work, you can go out and get your job paying $60,000. I want you to be somebody that has an option. Now, you can't say plan B because that's what the old folks used to tell us. Everybody needs a plan B. But as soon as you say that, you lose the kids these days. You can't say plan B. So you got to say an alternative or an option or something to get them out there. Now, I'm, I, went to, I went to college, okay, uh, finished with A's and B's, honors at uh, Historically Black Tuskegee University in Alabama. With that, <laughs> I was sent to a majority uh, white institution in Massachusetts to receive my master's degree. I paid zero for it. They took care of me. They said, here's a guy that uh, has done what he had to do. We wanted to come to work for us, but we know to do that, we need to entice him with additional schooling, they paid 100%, which, which was at that time about $80,000 worth of lodging, worth of transportation, and worth of education. Mm-hmm. So what I'm saying is we can do some things if we do if we put our minds to it and get it done. Now, I'm not saying everybody's going to go to college, but guess what? I won't be the guy that preaches against it because that's my background. That's the way I did it. That's the way I can show success. I can't tell you that going out here uh, doing something else will make you successful. That wasn't the way I did it. I went to college, got 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 a couple of degrees, made some money, and then I moved out. I moved on and started doing my own things now. I'm saying I know that blueprint works. It, it ain't for everybody, but I'm not going to be the one that preaches against it. I don't see Donald Trump telling his kids, hey, you know what, daddy already got millions. You don't have to go learn anything. No. Donald Trump says if you want any inheritance from me, you're going to go to somebody's college and you're going to get a degree. And once you do that, then we'll talk about what money you're going to get. See, to those folks, they understand education. Mm-hmm. They understand the value of it. It doesn't mean you're going to be a success. It doesn't mean you're going to be a, a, a loser. But in our community, I got people all the time telling me, look, we can go do this. We can do that. We don't have to get a degree. You're right. But you know what? I say go to college, and at least you might find out how much fun it is. You might want to stay. You might become a student. You can still be a a, a, a skilled welder or a plumber or anything else. But do that after you realize, hey, this college thing isn't for me. Don't allow somebody else to dictate the college isn't for you because if that's the case, uh, what would happen if somebody had told you that sixth grade wasn't for you? Would you have just dropped out in the fifth grade? Mm. Let's stop making excuses and let's go ahead and play the game the way it is. Like I said, we in Rome, you do as the Romans. Donald Trump and the richest people in society say you're going to somebody's college. You're going to school. Because they at least know that when they come out with a degree, even if they, they got C's all the way through, they can come out and get a, a job that pays $40,000 a year, which means they can try to create some type of generational wealth for their kids. That's the world we live in. I, I didn't make the rules. I'm just telling you. I know as soon as you walk into somebody's office and say, hey, look, I didn't finish my uh, high school career, they're going to say, oh, yeah, we'll give you a job, but it only pays $9 an hour. I didn't say you weren't smart. I didn't say you weren't brilliant. You just didn't get the certifications that you need to make the big money. As soon as you walk in, they're offering you $9 an hour. When I come in and say, look, I'm a Tuskegee University graduate, 
may not be any smarter than anybody else you got on your team, but I had the certification. They offered me forty, forty-five thousand. Mm-hmm. What I'm saying is, we got to get our folks to understand there's a way to play the game. There's a way to play the game. It doesn't mean any smarter or less smarter or less intelligent. It just means that these rules were made. If you think about it, we didn't have voting uh, rights. We were less than a person, you know, less than the one person when it came to voting. Somebody had to fight for these things. So the laws weren't written or established truly for black people. They weren't. I understand our history, which I know you are a history buff, so I'm, I'm, I'm singing to the choir here. But, man, there's some things that we can do, brother, to, to change our, our, the way we're being seen. What we're looking at as kids is that they say, you know what, if I'm a rapper and I'm successful, I can make a quick $2 million, $3 million, get some houses and some cars and some clothes. That's the fast way. That's the 40-yard dash. What I'm talking about is not the 40-yard dash. I'm trying to teach you how to run 20 miles in quicksand on a 105-degree what day. I'm giving them the backbone to say no matter what, you're going to be all right. You'll, you'll be in the game. And again, I know everybody won't agree with me, but I can tell you what worked for me. And, that, and that's valid enough. I mean, if it works for you, it means it works for somebody, and that's valid in, in itself. But the interesting thing about rappers, I was just thinking about the rappers, it's funny to me that people, it's an enigma thing with them because a lot of rappers did go to college and got degrees. You need to think about two chains. He went to Tuskegee. Or you think about Ludacris. He went to college. Uh, you look at people like uh, Eminem, people like that. These guys are, are great parents from whatever sources I can get. They, get, they take the time to tell their kids they can't listen to a certain type of music. They don't let the TV raise their kids. Then you got people like Master P is more impressive to me than Donald Trump any day of the week because he had to do it from nothing. Donald Trump had an inheritance. George W. Bush had an inheritance. The white folks have inheritance. They don't have to build generational wealth from scratch. But Master P did it by utilizing skill sets and a mind that never quit. Same thing with 50 Cent and Floyd Mayweather. These guys, we can learn a lot from the entrepreneurial spirit. But what I do also realize that people don't realize is the fact that a lot of these industries that a lot of these college-educated folks go into were started by people that might not even have a formal education to begin with. Some of my people like Thomas Edison, like Henry Ford, uh, like uh, Ray Kroc of McDonald's or uh, Colonel Sanders. And, and all these people, they use their life as an experience to, to work out certain things, like their ideas and whatnot. But there's, like they say, it's more than one way to skin a cat. But I think people need to know that going to college is not a bad thing, especially if you get something out of it. And uh, I definitely agree that college should be on the table as an alternative. But I want to hit the uh, the lines right quick. People are waiting patiently to talk to you and offer their opinion. And I just want to get to the line. Father, you're on the air. What okay. we all be? How are you doing today? Hi, are you speaking to me? Yes, sir. How are you doing? What's your name? Oh, yes, yeah, fine. Thank you. Look, I think you guys are having a phenomenal conversation and uh, I think it's Mr. Mr. Larry. I'm running back and forth uh, trying to get something done here. But uh, anyway, I, I think your guest uh, is, 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 is fantastic. You, he said, life isn't fair, get over it, and, and I couldn't stop chuckling at that. <laughs> and he laid it out. I just want to amplify one or two things and maybe ask a question. Uh, mm-hmm. He pointed out the proper procedure uh, for dealing with the police. Uh, being a policeman, that's a lousy job, first of all. They're dealing mm. with the worst of society. I call them the proctologist uh, of society. Mm. And mm-hmm. oftentimes they, they are not much different. Now, I've never had a negative encounter with the police. I've never had a policeman ask me to even get out of the car. And I have argued some issues with them. But I always respected them. I use the term officer as a prefer. Uh, I, I prefer uh, preface my statements with officer, and I know what to say to them if, if need be, to elevate it beyond them. And so, but I, I think the young people, there's a part to play on both sides to walk away healthy. The police are not owned by. Um, the people that you're talking about. And, and I think your title is good, but I think that needs to be dealt with. And, and if the police aren't owned by you, they aren't going to obey you. And so you, there has to be a happy medium, as your guest was saying, as to how 
uh, a person who's stopped by a policeman conducts themselves. So that is very crucial. I don't think that young man should have been shot down that way, but at the same time, there's a protocol, and that needs to be discussed. Like he said, you don't you you let the, you speak to the officer properly. You don't attack the officer. You don't fight with the officer. You fight in court. You, you can't get justice in the street. That's not the way the system is designed. And you talk about uh, in a world that's un. Uh, I was trying to recall the, I'm in another uh, area. Mm -hmm. You you talk about, uh, you know, trying to make it in a world that's not for you. I think that's very negative, and and it's okay to discuss that, but I think becoming an American, not just a black American, but an American, learning what it takes to get ahead in America, and I think that is a formidable problem for some people. Now, your guest, said it properly, as I agree again. He, he, he accessed the system appropriately. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. No, I, was, I will ask you, did you, say, you say you're a retired police officer? No, no, no. I, no, no. I, I, no, no, I didn't say that, no. Uh, I would never want to be a police officer. But I was explaining how that's a lousy job, and as your guest was explaining how one needs to approach it. But I was also talking about being an American, which is capitalism. Mm -hmm. The most important thing to do in America and what everything prepares one for is to get wealth. Wealth is power. And once you get wealth, you begin to get respect. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get respect, you can demand it. And so these are some things that are often not talked about. And I don't like just seeing oneself Mm -hmm. as a victim. I don't think the victim attitude is, is healthy. I think seeing one as a victor is, is much more appropriate. Now, I've said a few things, and I, I would like to know if, if, because I agree with him. I agree on virtually everything he said. Mm-hmm. Well, let me ask you this, then. Let me pose this question. Go ahead. I, I, I mean, I just want to ask him this. He said, you do everything that the cop tells you to do. If the cop has a wrong attitude, they might treat you the wrong way. If you're in a system that does not value black people to begin with, that biased people against black people based on media perception, if your life was on the line, if the cop said, to hell with you, I'm going to do something, I might kill you anyway, what would you do in that instance? Are you willing to work it out I in the, in the court? Doing, you not make it? Uh, if I may, let me just address this. I think you're using a, a hyperbolic example. I, I think you're using the exception to the rule juxtaposed to the rule. Uh, I think that most police, now some of them have an attitude. We're not, dis, we're not disagreeing with that. And uh-huh. that's where community policing comes in and, and, and where uh, accessing the system. If a policeman treats you badly, report his ass. The, the, the pen is mightier than the sword. Make no mistake about it. But I agree. You you're asking me a similar question to what you what you ask your your your, your fine guest. Mm-hmm. And the thing of it is, the the thing of it is, is this: we do have to put a certain amount of trust in the police. That just goes with policing. And generally, police do do a good service. I wouldn't want to be a policeman. I wouldn't be a policeman. Mm-hmm. So I, I think the way to respond to your question is the way it has been responded to by your guest and me. I, I totally uh, join with him in saying there's a protocol for one who's stopped the way they are to be, to behave. You don't escalate the problem. Say the policeman is an asshole, and some of them are, although I've never been treated badly by a police. Uh, policeman, I can understand a policeman being an asshole if I can say that. But mm-hmm. even if the policeman is an asshole, one is still subject to the policeman. And normally, that policeman is not going to just beat you up and do things to you. That just doesn't happen. You, you have to do something to provoke this. Now, I've only been tra- stopped for traffic stops. I, I have to confess that. I've never been stopped for a warrant or an armed robbery suspect or any of those sort of things. And what your uh, fine guest also said is that do the right 
thing. See, some people want to, like, for example, I heard this guy, I think the gentleman in, in New York, said to the police, leave me alone, stop bothering me. That's not the way to address the police because they have the power of arrest and they don't have to leave you alone. So you've, right. got to, you, 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 you've got to study strategies, just as he said, to address the situation properly. Let the officer know that you are cooperating. Even when I argue with the police, and I do, uh-huh. uh, I let them know I'm still cooperating. And if they want to arrest me, I will allow them to arrest me. I'm not going to resist them. Or they want to kill you. They're not trying to arrest you, though. Understanding. Or they want to kill you. If they, what if they want to kill you? But I'm saying something. Um, point. They haven't killed Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait. Hold up. Hold up. I've been okay, getting, been abused by police since I was 11 years old. Police been messing with me since I was 11. I've been pulled over several times this year alone with the police in different states. I'm a college graduate working on my doctorate okay. in education. I, I run it on, a, on my own nonprofit. I have my own media company. I do TV shows in Memphis. So if my life is in danger, here's a guy. I don't have a criminal record or arrest record. I have been in situations where police were being belligerent, disrespectful, and even had their hands on their triggers. And I did not offer any type of resistance whatsoever. It's just I have a cool head, and hopefully cooler heads will prevail. What I'm saying, as a black man who is 34, who's been pulled over by the police, and been messed with by the police since I was 11 years old, there is no good reason why a person, regardless of how shitty your job is and your position in life, to want to violate another person's life and right to exist on this planet. You have no right. I don't care what badge you wear, what your so-called authority is. As soon as you violate my human rights, you lose all your respect with me. You lose your authority over me. And all bets are off because I'm going to tell you something. If I'm a black parent and I did everything I can for my child to keep them out of trouble, to tell them to mind his P's and Q's, to stay in school, and they took my child's life, I don't know I could be on the television saying, I forgive everybody. It's okay because Jesus my man. He's going to take care of it. I don't have to get no compensation for my child. There's nothing they can do. If they took my child away from me under questionable circumstances, there is no amount of money in this hell for a black man that they could give me to compensate for the loss of my child. They took something from me that could never be refunded or given back. That's what I'm saying. Right, and I understand that. But may I ask you a question since you want to force the issue uh, on this? No, I'm just giving a different point of view because y'all both in agreement. I just want to give a different perspective out there, but go ahead. But yeah, yeah. So I want to ask you uh, very simply, mm-hmm. uh, what would you do? Uh, what's your response to your own question? I have a right to defend myself. Once you figure that you're going to take my life, I have a right to defend myself to make it to a court date, Okay. I have a right to defend myself to make it to a court date, to get my date in justice. Because that's the problem. Trayvon Martin fought his attacker. Mike Brown allegedly fought back his attacker. What is wrong with defending yourself? Emmett Hill, according to the people that killed him, fought back on them. Why is that black folks are always guilty? I think you raised some important issues, if I may. You you really raised some important issues. And this is, and I thought these things through. Trayvon Martin should not have been fighting with that man. You can't fight with people today. Now, now he he initiated it though, right? He's not initiated that. He wasn't a police officer. He initiated that. He was provoking Trayvon. He was following well, him around. I understand that, sir. I, I understand mm-hmm. the entire case. Uh, okay. What I'm saying to you is, what has to be taught, and this is pre-thought. This is pre-planning, as it were. You don't get into fracases with people that you don't know. You just don't do it because it's, it's too dangerous. And see, the other thing of it is, if you end up killing someone, which you, you very well may. I, I, I mean, I, I love Westerns, and I, I, they used to disarm <laughs> people, um, uh-huh. um, you know, when they came into town. But if, say, for example, if you misjudge and kill someone, now you're tied up in the system. So right. I think an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, if I just may throw that old bromide or aphorism in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, young people need to understand, or Trayvon, it would have been good for him to have been taught, you just don't fight with people like that. You, it's better to run. It's, it's really better to run. It's better to walk away. And he could have walked away. He really could have. 
Okay. And so uh, I, I think these are things that we need to discuss. And I would ask you, how did you, when you were uh, accosted by the policeman, how did you end up, uh, you know, get, getting away? You, you obviously didn't get killed. So right, what exactly. did you do to make it a successful uh, situation? Well, I didn't dehumanize myself. I gave them the proper respect, but I wasn't afraid. I've never been told to be afraid of police. You know, a lot of people go around telling kids to be afraid of police. You know, I, I had a grandfather who was in war. I mean, if your fears control you, if you are afraid, you're more likely to get killed being afraid and being fearful than you are not being afraid and not being fearful. If they are there to protect and serve, which they are not, they're not there for you, like you said earlier. They're there to protect the property of the state, of the wealthy elite. They're not there yes, to protect yes. and serve the community. They're there to, to slay the and to put you in be, place. Be, be, nothing says you can't become the elite, though. Excuse me for cutting you off. Well, yeah, sure. yeah, become part of the elite. Learn the system. See, there are two options. I, I actually teach financial intelligence, mm -hmm. uh, among other things. But there are two options, a person who identifies themselves as black. And I say there may be too strong of identification with black than an identification with character. Because there are black people that will stab you in the back, too. Yeah. So I, I would think maybe that needs to be mitigated a little bit. But I would say become an American. Learn capitalism. Learn how to seize power. Power yeah. is concentrated uh, energy, uh, able to overcome opposition. So I would say uh, in, in, in contradistinction to your subject, to your topic, mm -hmm. although I think it's a good thing for discussion, is to say, hey, like, you are, like, 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 your, 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 uh, like your guest says, hey, life is unfair. Get the hell over it. In right. other words, you know, learn how to work within the system, and it can be learned. It and can it be learned. Be. People do it, it every day. Okay. It's critical. It's life or death. It has to be learned. Yes, yes, precisely. See, we go, oh, yes, yes, yes. What I was going to say, there are only two options. Create your own system, learn the existing system, or fail at both. That's right. That's right. And that's, Thank you, you know, uh, that brings it back to good, a good piece. Thank you. I um, And I never did get the question you were going to ask. If you're still on, I want to get that. But, uh you know, the, the title of the book uh, is How to Make It in a World That Wasn't Made for You. Mm -hmm. so not in a oh, okay. Light. Yeah, yeah, not in a negative light uh, to say the world is not made for you, that wasn't made for you. Understanding our history in this culture with, with, with the right to vote, uh, the right to own land, uh, the right of, of <laughs> to own people, that type of thing. Right. Uh, so how to make it in a world that wasn't made for you. So definitely not in a negative context, but more of in a, hey, you have some, some situations that you don't understand, I put them down in the book because I want to reach as many young folks as I can, and I want to bring some solutions to you versus just ident identifying more problems. So I just wanted to clear that up so, so you didn't think there was a negative connotation to it. But mm -hmm. you said you had a, a question for me. I don't know if we lost it in the, in the dialogue, but if you still had it, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, we got a question oh, absolutely, first. absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, my question, and, and thank you. Yeah, my question would be, uh, how does one, given the statement that you made, and I like that, I, I like mm -hmm. that statement, how does one become powerful and wealthy? Because I, I think that is the goal of, of, of every uh, sentient and responsible uh, sane person, is how to become wealthy. W what would be your uh, suggestion or format or plan oh, for one to become you. wealthy? Thank you, sir. Go ahead, Brother Larry. Question. And, and uh, yeah, I, definitely, uh, like you said, it's a program. It's it's not a overnight type thing. It's a program. So how does one become power, powerful? I'll answer that, and then I'll bring the wealth piece into it. Power being the ability to determine outcome. I think by trying to become powerful, what you must do is relinquish power. Relinquish power. You've got to be willing to give up some power. What I'm saying is don't give up control. Make sure you understand the situation, but give up the power thing. At that point when you're trying to get there, you might have to work with a mentor. You may have to work with somebody who's older than you. You may be able to work with somebody who can give you some advice. Well, at that point, at that point it's not time for you to be powerful. You need to be humble. You need to say, hey, sir, mm -hmm. you've been doing this 25 years. Can you give me some expertise on what I need to do to get there? So be willing to relinquish some of your power so that you can get the knowledge that you need 
to become powerful. That's first thing. Second part of that is your education. Yeah, I, I tell people a man without education is like a bird without wings. You need to be educated, and that may not be formal. It may not be through schooling. You have to learn the craft. You have to learn what it is you're about to enter into. And once you do that, now you have some knowledge to go with that leverage that we were trying to bring in because you had to give up some power to get the knowledge. Now you have leverage because you understand what you're getting yourself into. And then from there, understand how the money is made. If you don't know how it's made, then you need to follow the person who's already made it. You may have to research them and say, how did this person do it? Okay, they started out renting duplexes or buying duplexes or what have you. At that point, you become the best at doing whatever it is you decide you want to do. Because if you become the best, the money will come. If you become the best in anything, the money will come. Uh, You know, uh, Russell Wilson, quarterback of Seattle Seahawks, was the lowest paid quarterback in the National Football League last year. But had a, a, only Peyton Manning had an equally as impressive quarterback rating, over 100%. But this guy, one, the richest quarterback in football, the other is the poorest quarterback in football. But guess what? The guy went on to, to win the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. He will now be able to impart some leverage on the league. He will get paid, whether he signs this year or at the end of this year to a new, a new deal. It will happen because he has proven – his value, and his worth to the league. So what I guess to answer your question, to get powerful, you must be willing to relinquish some or give the appearance that you're relinquishing some. Give the appearance that you are humble long enough to get the, in, to get the message, to get the learning and the teaching from your education, and then you do it like it's never been done before. Uh, thank you, brother. That was great. Yeah, thank you for the answer. And I also got another call of Sister Chandra. We ain't got a Mississippi. Are you there? What can we all be? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for holding. I know you've been holding very patient. Yeah, how you doing today? I'm doing well today. I'm blessed today just to be here. Blessed. Thank you. So you have a question on coming for our guest, Brother Larry Jemison? I want to thank you all for um, the conversation and I hear... um, I hear uh, wisdom in what he's speaking in terms of finding a way to work within the system that is to your benefit. And I appreciate that type of wisdom, and I appreciate also my father for telling me that in my life has really helped me. Uh, But at the same time, I also have learned some things about the system that we are living in that... uh, take away my confidence in that system overall, um, although not a human being. But um, so I respect that. And I wanted to ask, um, I guess about whether or not we have an awareness of an economic sector. Can you repeat that? It's a little uh, static in the back. You got a, is a computer on or whatnot? A little static. Oh, hold, on, hold on. Let me see. Maybe. All right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. We'll give you better now. Hello. Is that, can you hear me? Yeah, we'll hear you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask, do we have in, in our conversation, um, maybe an understanding of the economic situation that has made all this situation in terms of Michael Brown and Ferguson, the role that this type of stuff plays in our economy, which makes it uh, last so long, which, which, I mean, there's a reason not just that, you know, we have prejudice and we have to live with this and, And we're learning now in this conversation, how do we live with this prejudice? How do we work within it? How do we stay alive when we're pulled over by the police within such a system? All those things are so important to understand. But then the system itself has something built into it economically, which requires these things to happen in our lives. I, uh, so while we're, I'm sorry. No, no, keep going. I'm sorry. 
So, so when we are learning how to live within it so that we can go through our day-to-day lives, can we also see how we can uh, uh, rise above it in a way in terms of not having to spend the rest of our lives and our children's lives and generations learning how to live in a system that doesn't want us or is doing stuff that's bad for us all the time? And, we, you know, we do need to know how to do that, but at some point we have to change it. In terms of the economic aspect of it, a gentleman who called in mentioned um, capitalism and, and learning how to live within that system. Um, but, but capitalism itself, if, if I may just say something about it, uh, it is the way that our economy is structured. and Some people love it, some people hate it and whatnot. But one of the fundamental aspects or elements of a capitalist society is the need for a mass working class the need for cheap labor is one of the fundamental parts of a capitalist society. We have to have plenty of people available for cheap labor, a cheap labor force. That's what businesses need to make a profit. And I say that because the current housing for that mass pool of labor is the prison. And we see our children feeling this the prisons disproportionately, but we also see in media an image of our boys that's violent and untruth who we really are. Mr. Larry here right now is a reflection of what a real man, a real black man, Brother Ron, of course, a reflection of what a real black man, all of these, you all are the real reflection. So this thing serves a purpose, and that's what I'm saying. So when we finish, you know, finding out how to, respond in the system and get them to charge these people and do different things, what are we going to do about the circumstance that we live in overall that that leads to the death of our children? Brother Rock, can I address that? No, oh, yeah, go ahead, brother. Thank you, uh, Carla, for calling in. First of all, you hit on <laughs> a number of uh, a number of topics. So, we'll, you know, I'm going to condense them a little bit, but uh, I appreciate the uh the, the, the compliment that you gave uh, myself and Ron. Uh, here's the thing, and, I, and I'll go back to the premise of this call and how we got started, but educating our minds, going through the system. You talk about the system and how do we compete in a system that uh, that may have not have been designed for us, and, and, and day, to day to day it looks like it's not designed for us. Let me show mm-hmm. you. One thing is... We have to gain the education, okay? I have a quote that I use all the time. And I say this is the only country where ed- education is mandatory but learning is optional. Mm. We send our, our kids to school every day. Every day. It's forced. By law, they have to go. But whether they learn anything or not, that, that falls back on us. It falls back on the parents. It falls back on the, 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 the kids. We have to get the education. What I'm saying is when we send our kids off, we're not sending them off to have a play or or have a good time. We're sending them to learn something. We didn't come up with this. Black folks were were still in bondage. We didn't. This is something that our people fought hard so we have the ability to go to school, not only go to school, but go to school with everybody, right, and to create. We fought hard for those. We, We fought for that. Even... In the 70s, I, uh, I was watching an episode of Good Times, and mm-hmm. James told Michael, hey, look, boy, I don't want you to come up like me. Living in these projects in Cabrini Green in Chicago, south side of Chicago, you're going to go to school get an education. Even during those years, even the years preceding that, Papa and my mom were working the fields, but they said, you young man, you young woman are going to school to get an education, so you don't have to do this type of work. Mm-hmm. See, that's the, that's, the, that's the system that we're in. You have to become educated first. If you don't, when you get ready to go get a job, the first question they're going to ask you is, what's the highest level of education completed? And if you say, I'm a college graduate, well, then they have a set of jobs for you over here. If you say you have a master, they may have a little bit elevated. If they have a doctorate, they may be a little higher. But as soon as you say, I don't have any of those, I'm not even a high school graduate, well, then they're going to look in a whole other area for jobs. And they're going to say, well, this is what you're going to be. And you're right. We do depend on a working class 
community to drive our economy. But do you want to be amongst that working class or do you want to be amongst that management class? Only you can decide that. Mm. Me, myself, I want to build wealth. I want to become so wealthy in this capitalist, capitalistic society, which I think is the greatest society in the world, I want to become so wealthy that my kids and their kids and their kids have access to money, wealth, and power. That's what I want. But to build that, I had to go to school. I had to get the knowledge. And then once I got the knowledge, I went to work with some folks. I got more knowledge, and I also got some money. I got some 401K. I got some pension. I got to travel around the world on their dime. I learned a lot at other people's expense. And now I can open up my own company, open up my own business, and say, you know what, I need to make X amount of dollars for me to be happy with my lifestyle, for me to give that generational wealth back down to my children. So the short line, the short line answer to your question is get the education because it means something in this country. The system is built upon it. And let me tell you something else, and I'll wrap it up. When you get ready to go for that job interview, they don't ask you what neighborhood you came from. Ooh. They don't say, are you from North Memphis? Are you from Bankhead? Are you from Compton? They don't ask that. They say, what level of education did you complete? You say, I'm a college graduate. They say, okay, good. You got a transcript? Yeah, I can get it. Okay, good. And then if you, may, if you impress them, they want to make you an offer. They don't care about what hood you came from. See, that's what we get caught up in. Man, I'm from the block, dog. I'm from here. I'm from there. They don't ask that question on the application. They don't ask that question on the, uh, when you're going through your interview. Because it's irrelevant. They want to know at that point, do you have the skills and the knowledge worthy of getting this job and performing at a high ability or to your highest ability? So a lot of things we're concerned with, they're not concerned with. Get the education. From there, you can move any direction you want to go. And then they always going to be pretty. There's people out here with college degrees that are struggling and suffering just like anything else, but you have options because you're playing within the system. Thank you, Brother Larry, for that. And Sister Chan, Chandra, for that wonderful question. <clears throat> Excuse me, observation. We're going to move on down, further down south. Head on down to H Town, where they get down. Queen of Sierra, you're on the air. Uh, welcome to We All Be. Hey, Brother Ron, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm well, and hello to you, guys. I'll be here for feedback. You got the computer or something on in the background, by any chance? Mm-mm. Okay, maybe it'll be improved. Yeah. But yeah, go, go ahead. You got any questions or comments for our, our guests? Yes, um, I think it was a caller that called in and spoke mm-hmm. about uh, how we have to teach our children how to respond to the police officers. And uh, he mentioned <clears throat> Trayvon Martin should have run from George Zimmerman. Mm-hmm. And my thought on that is I thought Trayvon Martin did run from George Zimmerman which he shouldn't have to because he was just a young boy walking home from the store and some mm-hmm. man is following him, calling the police on him, and tracking him down with a gun. So what was he supposed to do? And I think it is a problem. And let me, let me just go back to that quickly. And uh, he did try to defend himself. Let's just be clear about that. And this man was not a police officer. So he doesn't have to show him any kind of uh, respect an official. And then um, secondly, when the brother mentioned about uh, um, how we respond to police officers and we have to be polite and we have to do all of this and that, go through all of these different motions and actions, I think it's a serious problem when there's a difference in how white people or people of other ethnic groups teach their children how to respond to police versus the way we have to teach our children. We have to teach our children, just like your guest said, oh, let me put my hands where the police can see them. Let me get all my stuff together so they won't blow my head off. You know, and that's ridiculous. Why do we have to go through those extremes, Ron? Why do we have to go through these extremes? And I, and I think your earlier guest, when I first tuned in, mentioned uh, it was a surprise that uh, everything started in Ferguson versus um, New York. Um, I right. kind of came in a little late. I don't know if she was referencing the Eric Gardner situation. Well, it's caused like what the brother called in and said. I can see why it kicked off in Ferguson. Because if we have people that believe 
that, oh, we have to be a certain way with police officers, and we have to get them all this authority and all this stuff so they won't blow our heads off. Even though we're walking around here innocently, coming from the store, standing outside of a store, like Eric Gardner. He was polite, Ron. Eric Gardner was polite. He said, please, officers, leave me alone. I'm not doing anything. Please, officers, don't touch me. And I can understand why he said don't touch him because they had already sexually assaulted him. So why is it that people believe we have to continue to cower down? I'm not saying when police officers approach you, you buck up and take this attitude of why he's talking to me and all. I don't do that Mm -hmm. either because I know they'll blow my head off. But it's a problem when police officers approach us differently versus how they approach other people. That's a big problem, and I just had to call in. I enjoyed the show, and I'm, I was listening, and I just had to press one when I heard him say, Trayvon Martin's parents should have taught him how to run. What? <laughs> he was yeah. walking home from the store in his neighborhood, mm-hmm. just like Mike Brown, walking home from the store. And the thing about us is we want to sit here and believe everything. It's funny how we can believe everything what the police say, but then you have several witnesses that stated how this police officer approached him in an inappropriate way. So it's okay for police officers to approach us violently and belligerently, but then the minute we act like we may want to respond, then they have the authority to blow your head off. Yeah. and leave your brains running down the street like Mike Brown, yeah. and leave you dead on the sidewalk like Eric Gardner. That's a problem. So all of this other jibber jab talk about this, this, and that, and capitalism and all of this crap, I can't even believe that. When we have children dying, walking home from the store, and you're talking about how you want to succeed in a capitalistic system, give me a break. That's all I have to say, Ron. Thank you. Queen, thank you so much for your time and for your observation and comment. You just came from Ferguson, correct? You just experimented the Ferguson yes, insurrection yourself. How was that experience? Yes. That experience was, it was an awesome experience because, it was an awesome experience because not only was it a rally, it was an organizing period for people to connect. Um, people that were serious about going there were charged with coming back with numbers and reconnecting, organizing more rallies, organizing how to protect our communities, organizing how to uh, teach people this process of of dealing with the police officers and voting and laws and all of this. So it was more than just people going and saying, no justice, no peace. This is serious. This is a movement. These people are not playing. These young brothers down in St. Louis and the Ferguson area are tired of seeing their friends shot down. I talked to the Lost Voices. I talked to the young man that set up the tent city uh, right up the street from uh, where he was executed. They've been out there since August 9th, and they said it's not just about Mike Brown. They named off several of their friends that had been killed just like Mike Brown. Mm -hmm. And if you listen to some of the YouTube videos, you can hear people talking about, yeah, they did that too. So-and-so, when he came out of his house, he came out of his house, didn't even have a gun. The police shot him. Uh, Yes, so-and-so was sitting on the side of his house. They came around and shot him. Okay? I don't know, Ryan, you from Memphis. Do you remember, uh, this was years ago, the little boy, he had a name similar to to Trayvon Martin. His name was Trey something. 14 years old in Arkansas, walking from the store with Mm -hmm. his friends, same incident, same type of incident, walking from the store, had a drink can in his hands, Police officers claim they thought he had a gun. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Hey, so hey, Ron, I would just talk about how we got to do that. Oh. Go ahead, brother. Larry. I want to, yeah, brother. Larry, you can intervene. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to to her issues um, and some of her concerns. I appreciate her calling in, and I I uh, appreciate her her uh, compassion Sorry. Uh, and passion for the subject. And uh, you know, whether she agrees with my views or not, that's that's indifferent. That's not what this is about. She's right. It is serious. Uh, I think what the other caller who came in was saying was not Trayvon should have run, but basically try to avoid the issue as as, as quickly as possible or whatever. Did he know. not say, but did he, brother, did he no, not he say Trayvon should have run? He, he said that, did not. Yeah, but I think what he was trying to insinuate was at that point, 
Trayvon was unarmed. This guy had a, had a pistol and meant to do Trayvon harm. The best thing for Trayvon that way is to try to get away the best he could. Now, we weren't there. Right. You know, that running could have been 100 yards. It could have been 50 yards. It could have been there was no way for Trayvon to get away. I think right. his, his point was just saying try to avoid the altercation as much as possible. Because but did he try to avoid that? But did, did he not try to no, avoid he did. that? He did. He did. Okay. I'm, I'm not justifying anything that anybody did in Florida. Uh, mm-hmm. I know that was an injustice. I, I am 150% on your, on your side that that was an injustice and a travesty. Uh, so I, I was just saying what I think the, the belief of the other caller was. He, you know, I think what, what he was just trying to say was Trayvon was, uh, you know, he, he, had a, he had a better shot trying to get away then tried to confront if there was a conversation because of this, this gun. But let's move on from that. My thing is this, okay? I'm glad you were able to make it out to Ferguson. I'm glad you represented, and I'm glad you're still rallying for the troops. But here's the thing. Our kids are being killed every day. They're being blown away every day. So now we have to come up with results. And what I was saying was how to treat the officers with some respect and some and and yes sir no sir that type of thing was to try to give some of these kids a chance. Let me tell you what I'm saying. Our image as young black men to the world is that of thugs, that of animals. I don't know if you listen to, listen to any hip hop music lately or look at any movies with our image portrayed. We're not noted for anything but entertainment and sports. That's what we're noted for. You look at other races, you think about Asians, and you think of science and math. Mm-hmm. You, you, you think of Koreans, and you think of import businesses and new businesses being started. You think of Hispanics, you think of people that work hard. When you think of black America, you don't, especially young black males, you don't come up with a positive image. And neither does the world. The world sees us as thugs because we've painted ourselves as such. We've made billions of dollars in the hip-hop community and on film and on the entertainment community painting ourselves as Lil Wayne, Jay-Z, and 50 Cent. That's what we've done. We've created an image that this is who people know because they're not in our neighborhood. They have their own neighborhood, they have their own schools, and they have their own ideal of who we are as a people. So for us, when the, when the police confront us, they're automatically thinking, I'm confronting an animal, a thug. I don't care how compassionate, how nice we are. That's their, their image. So what I'm saying is try to put this person at ease. It doesn't mean that we're going to walk away without a bullet in our head. But I've got to try to give our kids the best chance of making it. And to me, that chance is if you can get away from that situation, you don't try to win in the street. You may have to go to jail, but then you fight it in court and try to do your best there. It's no guarantees. But I can tell you, they're not approaching us like they would a white person because they don't see us in the same light. They don't value us. They see a rapper. They see a thug. That's who they see. That's our image. That's what we portray. They see saggy pants. So, therefore, if we want to save our kids or at least give them a chance, we have to try to play within the rules. We don't have the power in the streets. We can't go vigilante. We have to try to give them a chance to make it home to mom and daddy, and they can say, Mom, Dad, Uncle, Auntie, you know what happened to me today? This is horrible, and we need to talk to somebody about it. At least then they have a chance. When they're on that street, it's open season, and it's not just the police. Anybody can walk up with a gun right now, put it up to a black person's head, fire the pistol, kill them, and say there was a struggle. At that point, it becomes a matter of whose side do you believe. Do you believe the dead black person who's on the ground who by chance when they run an autopsy had marijuana in their system like that meant something? Or do you believe the white person who said, well, he, he, he uh, came up to me and did? It's a very, very sensitive subject. I'm here in Georgia where gun laws and, and Glock is headquartered, gun, everybody's armed. Mm-hmm. You don't want to have a confrontation with, with anybody. So that's all I was saying. I, I'm, I'm just as compassionate. I'm just as down for the fight, but we can't win in the streets. That's not the way we're about to do it. We've got to organize and get some people on our side as well. I mean, I'm thinking that you. Um, I'm about to do a part two with you because a lot of people don't want to talk to you. You lit up the switchboard. I'm going to take one more call if it's okay. I don't want to be uh, mess with your time because I, I want to thank you for being on the show. But I have to have you on again because you really lighting up the switchboard to what you're saying right now. And uh, Erico eight five zero, you on the air? Welcome, we all be. Yeah, 
Uh, hey, how y'all doing? How you doing, man? What's your name? Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Ken Farmer. I'm calling from Memphis, Tennessee. Oh, brother Ken, how you doing today? Man, I'm pretty good. I just ended up. I guess seen a, seen one of your uh, emails, and I said, "Well, let me call." And I ain't doing nothing. I'm. I'm not <laughs> yes, in the house. I work in the school system. Mm-hmm. Uh, so kind of a lot of what's going on, what y'all talking about, I can see. You know what the other young man was talking about education. I'm like, you know, I'm a sub, and mm-hmm. children are going to school to eat and get on the internet. <laughs> they ain't going to school to learn nothing. I've mm-hmm. been working over at uh, BTW, like you know, mm-hmm. it's supposed to be a historic school. You got the little marker right in front of the school as you walk in there. Yes, sir. You about the first school, public school for blacks, and when you look at where the system has allowed that to disintegrate to mm. and how terrible the children are, you can't blame them for the environment they walk in. As soon as they walk out of that door, they they in hell because the mm. damn projects is right there. Mm-hmm. And what's so sad about it, you got Mason Temple right across the street, the home of the Coastal Church. That's right there. So that's opposite telling you something. The religious power ain't doing anything to really make a difference in these young people's lives. Because it's terrible. And when it comes to the police, I'm like, hey, I just got put in the back seat of the car this weekend in front of my house. Wow. What happened? You mind telling us what, what went down with that? Sure. Well, uh, I have a group uh, called the Three Kings. We were out. We did a little show, a little city release party over the weekend. And mm-hmm. it's about 4 o'clock in the morning. We came, coming home. I'm just we're sitting up in the car, wrapping up the night, just talking about what we went through and everything. And I had, we, we saw the cop on the street as we pulled up, and he was down further down the road. And as we were sitting in the car with the lights off in the car, he came up on the car and asked us, what are we doing sitting in the car? And I said, well, this is my house. We're just sitting in front of the house talking. So he kept, you know, you know, well, uh, come on, you know, open the door and all this stuff. And I'm like, my partner's car didn't open up from the inside. She had to unlock it from the outside. Mm-hmm. So we had to slide in the car the keys through the window, opened the door, and then he snatched me out of the car, handcuffed me, put me on the curb, eventually cool. put me in the car, closed the door, and I'm told time I'm trying to say where I live here. You know, I, I, I is it wrong for me to sit outside of my house when I live here? Cool. So eventually he got my partner out of the car, asked him questions, and my partner was saying he was asking him, why can't, what's wrong with your friend? Why can't he just be still? I'm like, I'm not doing anything. I, I was real calm, you know, because I listened to a, a lot of Neely Fuller a lot. Mm-hmm. He tell you, you know, you just, you don't, you don't, you don't fuss with him, you don't argue with him. And I didn't. I was just calm and cool. I just did whatever he asked me to do. Eventually, he put both of us in the car, and he took our social security numbers and saw that yes, I do live here. They let me go. They didn't write no report. You know, I didn't. I, I should have got the badge number, but mm-hmm. you know, this type of stuff is happening. All the time, the people that look like me, dark-skinned, you know, I got dreads, but a lot of people don't have dreads. So, you know, we can do what we want to do. We can go get whatever job you want to get because I got a college degree, too. So Mm -hmm. you can have all that stuff. It's not making a difference. People who are classified as non-white, we are in trouble. Brother Ken, thank you for sharing the arresting officer that he apologized. Was it a black officer or a white officer that arrested you? Or held you, not a oh, white officer. He apologized. Yeah, officer, and, uh, he, was, he didn't really give a, a a real apology. He was he was he came with the excuse where he was by himself, and you know he didn't know what we were gonna do. I'm like, well, you could have kept this driving. You know, <laughs> why did you stop and bother me? Mm-hmm. If you were worried about something else, you could have waited for backup or something. But I'm sitting in front of my house the whole time, and I'm. You know, he couldn't even let me. I could have gave him my license to show him, like, hey, you know, I do live here, you know. But he didn't really give an apology. And, you know, it was just like after that, he just they rolled off. They didn't write no report up. You know, that I, so I could have got some type of, you know, something out of this whole situation. I pretty much just had to deal with it. Was he a younger or older cop? Was he a veteran or kind of like a young cop? I think he might have been in his, in his 30s. He probably just, this young probably guys, stuck. Probably. Yeah, young guy. Probably switched over from a different career he was selling at, probably. And a lot of them changed the careers a lot. I talked to a couple of cops. But, you know, Booker T. Washington, the people don't know, understand the significance of that high school. You talk about the track and from that high school. Booker T. Washington is an exceptional, as far as his history goes, high school. 
There's the same high school where Marion Barry went to high school at the former mayor of D.C., Washington, D.C., a very popular political figure up in D.C. There's also the former, uh, the, the high school of W.W. W. Harrington, who was the first black elected mayor of Memphis. Lucy Campbell, the mother of gospel music, taught there for decades. Uh, Maurice White, one of the founding members of Earth, Wind, and Fire, went to that school. Johnny H., arguably the first black rock and roll legend, or the first rock and roll legend, period, was a dropout of Booker T. Washington High School. Mason Temple is the last place where Dr. King spoke. That was his final speech, the Mountain House speech was given at Mason Temple. So to give you a background of what this school was and is, I substituted, uh, I did substitute teaching at Booker T. Washington. I can verify what the brother said. And also, that was the school that Barack, uh, Barack Obama gave a commencement speech to a couple years ago. They won the national contest for the president to come down to give the commencement uh, speech. So Booker T. Washington is just not any ordinary school, but what he's talking about is a microcosm of the public education system for people of color, black people around the nation. So I just want to give that background. And also, Brother Farmer, what people don't realize that Memphis Police Department has been responsible for 23 civilian deaths in these past two years. Wow. 23 civilian deaths. We won the Great. most brutal police departments in the nation, but it's underreported. We under the radar. But you can't kill 23 people. And should, you should be on the front pages. I mean, you're talking about Ferguson. You're talking about New York and Chicago and Ohio, L.A. Memphis, 23 civilian deaths in two years, and the year is not over yet. That's in the 18th month period, that 23 years. So you lucky, brother. You got your life, brother, from So thank you so much for calling in with your story. I appreciate it. So, Brother Larry, do you have anything to add? I don't want to keep you over time. I have a little bit, but Brother Larry, do you have anything to add closing thoughts? Man, look at Ron. You're not keeping me over time. This is my time. This is what we have to do. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, we invest. We invest. We're investing in our community, and there there is no right time. Injustice mm-hmm. doesn't come at the right time. You know, we we just have to stick stick to the fight, man. And and I can tell you this: for that young man who just called in, I'm sorry he had to go through that. But I know that experience. I've been there. Mm-hmm. I've been out in the community, never doing, not, not doing anything, and having to show my ID. What you doing over here? Hey, I'm coming to visit a friend. Oh, yeah, let me see your ID. Guess what I don't do? I don't cop an attitude. I pull my ID out. I know mm-hmm. when you run my name and my record that's clean and clear. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to escape harm's way, but at least he says, well, this ain't the dope deal I might have been looking for. Or maybe he was just profiling. Maybe he said, I got a young male right here, six feet tall, uh, 188 pounds, and he fits the profile. Because I always fit the profile, and you do too. Mm-hmm. I understand right. that. So what we have to do is show some respect. What I'm saying is, I know, it, it goes back to what we were saying to the first call. Sometimes you have to humble yourself long enough to get to the next level. Well, sometimes we have to humble ourselves to get to the next moment, to get to the next day. So I feel sorry for the young man who got pulled out, uh, who got pulled uh, to the side by the, by the officers, but that's part of our life. It shouldn't come as a surprise. It shouldn't be something that makes us want to give up mm-hmm. hey, for the next Ten minutes, you let them run your ID, you let them check you out, find out you're not, you know, doing anything that you're not supposed to do, and you keep it moving. Now, here's the other piece of that. A lot of times, these officers have quotas. They're trying to reach their quotas. they got to have so many arrests. they got to have so many DUI stops. So they are running license plates. They are looking for anything they can find. They pull you over and run your ID, and it's not clean. Mm-hmm. Well, you've invited a problem into your situation now. Sometimes we're in the wrong. Sometimes we do have some marijuana or something on our on our presence or, or something that's illegal. Sometimes that does happen where you've invited more trouble to you. I'm not saying that either way is fair. You had no reason to stop me, pull me over, whatever, but now you did, and you run my place and find out I'm wanted for two arrests or have a warrant out, and you've invited trouble in. So I, I say that. To say we, this world isn't made for us, we have to understand that. Don't be surprised when they treat you differently than they treat the next person. Don't be surprised when you don't get the promotion on your job that you thought you should have got. The world is not made for us. The laws were not built for us. But that hasn't stopped me one bit. We have to outthink. We have to grow stronger. You know, we, we have to do some bigger things. Brother Ron, I think to myself every day, there's mm-hmm. Google, there's an Instagram, 
Instagram, there's a Facebook, there's a Twitter. Where is the black big technological breakthrough? You know what I mean? Where is the black Google? Where is the black Apple? Mm. See, that's how my mind works. Instead of looking at all the negatives that we could compile and say this life ain't right, I start looking at the imbalances and says, Larry, why don't you come out with the first multi-billion dollar tech company? Why don't you do that? Now, I may not do it, but the thing is my mind is not spinning my wheels on something that's negative. I'm always looking for the next big thing, and hopefully it's a blockbuster because if it is and it becomes a success, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to come back and say, Brother Ron, you need to bring me back on the show. I want to tell you all the groups that I funded with the money that I made from the sale of my company. Mm. I'm going to tell you about all the young black men and women that I'm able to help out because instead of sitting at home moping about why somebody doesn't like me or doesn't treat me right or because I was too dark, I'm going to tell you about what I did with my dark skin to make my company a success so now I can buy everybody at Booker T. Washington High School a a tablet or a laptop Mm. or something that's going to advance and further education. That's where our mindset has to go. Well, Larry, you are going to be back on the show again. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, you got to bring me back, man. No, I'm going to bring you back. Ain't no question about it. You really sparked a lightning rod in the people, man. They are, the switchboard is still full, but we got to cut it short for right now. But, Brother Larry, I just want to get – why can people contact you and bring you to their city or to their group? Because you're a motivational speaker and a life coach, and, you know, you got so many things going on. What is the best way for people to find out what's going on with you and keep in touch? Best way to contact me is LarrySpeaks.com, L-A-R-R-Y dot S-P-E-A-K-S dot com. Um, and I also give them my my, uh, my email, which is info, I-N-F-O, at Larry, L-A-R-R-Y, S-P-E-A-K-S dot com. Send me an email. I always get back to you. I always respond, and we're always going to find some solutions. We're not going to sit back and complain. We're going to get it done. That's what we do. So, Brother Larry, in the words of the great Duke Ellison, we love you madly. Keep on producing and pushing. It's an honor to you know, share some time with you today. And you're definitely coming back on this show again, no doubt about it. So you take care of yourself. Well, man, same to you, man. Keep doing what you're doing. We need you out there. Yes, sir. I'll see you on the battlefield then. Thank you, sir. You'll see me in the front lines. You got it. Yes, sir. Okay. One love, everybody, and thank you. And we'll be back again very soon, no doubt about it. Have a great weekend.